But goodness gracious, what a powerful beast of a thing this was. So we've all heard of the idea, you shouldn't meet your heroes. And in the car world, that can be particularly true. It doesn't matter how much you build something up in terms of what it could be in your mind or how beautiful that Countach looked on a poster on your bedroom wall as a child. If you actually get in one on any road that isn't huge, empty, and perfect, it ends up being a rather miserable experience. And so as you kind of dream of these cars and you want to own something one day, you always have to temper that excitement a little bit with the idea that it might just not live up to the hype. And for all the cars that I've loved over the years, the Bugatti Veyron for me has always been one of those cars where I sort of had that concern. And in 1998, the same year that Audi bought Lamborghini, Volkswagen bought Bugatti. And there started to be rumblings and rumors that they were going to bring out some pretty cool cars. And they brought out a concept in 1999 called the Chiron, which had 18 cylinders. About a year later, around 2000, they sort of started talking about a variation of that called the Veyron but they didn't actually come up with a prototype of it until 2003. And nobody really knew much about it other than the fact that it was supposed to have a thousand horsepower. And so I was kind of excited to see what the market for the Veyron was gonna do, but as a 17 year old high school student, obviously it wasn't something I could easily participate in. And so what I did is I got in touch with a German dealer that knew the Bugatti factory well, and they were planning to become a representing dealer for the brand. And I told them that I was interested in a Veyron and that I wanted an allocation and that I needed it in writing, but that I also wanted it to be transferable because since it was this new kind of pseudo upstart brand, I didn't want to be married to the idea and if I could flip it and sell it, I wanted that ability to. And I got a letter from Bugatti signed by the CEO at that point guaranteeing my early allocation and establishing my price and I think 1.2 million or so US. When the car ended up coming out, it was about 1.4 million in US dollars, even though there wasn't an MSRP set in dollars. So it would have saved me a good bit of money if I'd been able to consummate the transaction. Obviously, I didn't have the money, but I figured you know, there were gonna be some flippers and speculators who might be willing to pay me for the allocation. So I made a few calls to a different, you know, different dealers and people that I thought might pay me for it and told them I wanted 100 grand for it. And one actually agreed. I sent them a copy of the letter, and at the time, I think I had just had a phone call with the CEO of Bugatti talking about flying me to Molsheim for pedal fitting and seat fitting and option selection and things like that, but I kept sort of obviously pushing it off because I wasn't going to do that. But I got this guy really interested, and he had a client that he was kind of managing a collection for, and we went back and forth. And I can't actually remember the reason that the deal fell apart, but for whatever reason, the guy didn't end up buying it from me, and obviously I didn't make $100,000 as a 17-year-old by selling a piece of paper. But it was cool to kind of go through the motions and you know use my low voice to seem older than I was and, and have a lot of fun. But over the next few years, obviously, I saw the full announcement, the release, and the whole life cycle of the Veyron, and it was always just such an iconic car, but it was sort of cliche to think that it was just the greatest thing out there. But honestly, I always did. I thought it was just fantastic. The ideology and uncompromised approach of we're going to lose money on every single one of these after our development costs, but it's worth it because the, the world needs these types of halo cars and these aspirational ideas that guys like us can aspire to. But I worked on a few deals that involved Veyrons or hey, talked to guys that owned them and they all seemed pretty positive about them, but nobody really drove them that much. And so it was always kind of hard to gauge, like, is the car as good as I want it to be? But I actually ended up selling T-Pain an orange 2008 Gallardo Spider that a couple of years later he ended up trading on his Veyron. And in doing that deal, I got to explain to him that I had bought the 360 he'd given one of his artists as a birthday present, or my wife had, and that uh, we'd enjoyed it for a little while and sold it. He was entertained at the notion that this guy's parents had somehow electronically destroyed the car. But we had a good relationship there and I saw that car and I knew he'd had some issues with it. And obviously the Veyron's reputation is that of just catastrophic maintenance expense. We're all familiar with you know, the $25,000 tires from Michelin and the complicated mountain balance procedure and the fact that an annual service is somehow $21,000 and that you have to do all this stuff to keep the car in good standing with the factory so that if you ever sell it, the future buyers don't talk to the factory and they badmouth your car and your neglect of it. And I had a client at the Lamborghini dealership that we'd sold a good number of cars to and he ended up wanting to buy a Veyron. He was actually the guy who I was talking to as Nick crashed his motorcycle in the parking lot and kind of derailed that as we went to the emergency room to have his face sewn back up. 
But he had continued and ended up buying a car that was local to Atlanta and taking it to his home. And it was a brilliant car for him. And as, as I kind of helped him and talked him through the buying process with it, we would learn about the service history and about what had been done and what he could anticipate in owning it. And some of the strange things, like you can't change the tire pressure without the HP PDA and things like that that were just unique to it. And no different than the way that the old modem connections required for maintaining a McLaren F1. Just these things happen. They come. They become sort of a part of the car. And it was a very, very cool car to see. And he, he was enjoying it. But he did say that among all the cars that he'd owned, including very brightly colored Lamborghinis, it commanded an attention that really did make him uncomfortable. He said it was different than with like his Lamborghinis where somebody would just kind of stop him and say, hey man, that's an awesome car. With a Veyron, since they knew you know, it was a million dollar plus automobile, they would follow him down the street for miles and miles or follow him into a restaurant and ask the Major D where he was and who he was and what he did and things like that. So I heard that from him and you know, I, I understand that. I mean, certainly it goes with the territory, but that doesn't mean it's comfortable. But I was planning a trip up near him to, to go to a Cars and Coffee meetup near his house. Uh, we all sort of caravaned over and it was just amazing really to see the, the aura of the car. And certainly when you kind of get up close to these things, you kind of wonder like, is it going to be like an aging starlet, like beautiful from 20 feet away. But as you get up, you start to see, ah, well, this wasn't built quite that well, or the materials weren't exactly what I thought they were going to be. No, not really. I mean, the car is amazing to behold. The paint's a mile thick and every detail simply couldn't be crafted any better. And so the field of people around it was obviously dramatic and exciting to see. And so we went on to lunch and just got to continue kind of seeing how the car works in the real world. And it didn't seem all that, you know, crazy compromised. It didn't seem like it was a huge chore to operate, like certainly some automobiles could be. And he was enjoying it, but also just kind of getting a little bit tired of the attention. But when we went back to his house, he said, Ed, do you want to drive it? <laughs> and, and normally, you know, I get offered to drive a lot of people's cars. And in most cases, it's simply not worth it because I don't want to risk damaging the car and then potentially damaging the relationship. Or, you know, it just may not be worth driving a different version of something I have a lot of experience with. But in this case, the answer was absolutely I do. And I got to sort of feel just how it all worked. And I mean, it, you know, the user interface was very kind of Audi Volkswagen group like. It was not that intimidating to get into. And, you know, once the car's up to a reasonable ride height, it kind of goes over bumps and things without too much drama and around small roads and things it was pretty easy but then we took it out on the highway and I've been in a lot of really really high horsepower cars and owning them and selling them and things like that and you know even some thousand plus horsepower cars and twin turbo Gallardos and you know cars of this nature but goodness gracious what a powerful beast of a thing this was the power built immediately and was super smooth because the turbochargers are pretty small so there wasn't a big gap or lag or anything like that the car just went and it never stopped. And even on this you know, fairly congested and fairly tight highway, I still, I mean, effortlessly managed probably 175 miles an hour. And it wasn't dramatic to me or him and he wasn't worried about it. And the car's brakes and everything else about it were just superb. There was nothing about the car, even at this point as the car was several years old, nothing was dramatic. Nothing seemed to make it even breathe hard. And that was unbelievable because I mean, on a car that was built in 300 units and then obviously the other 150 of the convertible versions, that's not many to get a car this dialed in and perfect. And he had told me, I guess a little bit before that, that the best way he had found to describe it was actually an appliance metaphor. He'd said that, you know, you have a really nice refrigerator or appliance or oven or whatever the case may be, and it's good and it does everything. But if you go see a commercial grade appliance, it's just built to a higher standard. It feels indestructible for anything you'd ever throw at it. It feels like they thought of everything I could ever do, plus things that people who were way better than me might ever do to it, and they made sure it could tolerate that. And that's what was so impressive about the thing. I mean, the car was monstrous, but it wasn't breathing hard. Nothing was challenging for it. And it was so, so fast and it just never stopped. So I don't really know if I could ever tolerate the ongoing ownership cost or the possibility that you lose a hundred plus thousand dollar part of which there are many on the car. But I did absolutely love it and it lived up to every part of whatever dream or fantasy I could ever have had. But as we parked it, I sort of left myself sort of contemplating like, do I want to make this the next dream? Because my career at Motor Cars of Georgia, selling exotic cars, was really characterized as most people's sales careers are, as like, what am I saving money to buy? Because you work so hard and you take so much time that the materialism is really what keeps it going. 
But as it got towards late in 2015 and I had a one-year-old son and I was sort of contemplating like, all right, do I really want to take this to that next level? One of the reasons I quit <laughs> was that I didn't want to make myself want a Veyron <laughs> because I thought that's the only other thing that I can think of that I'd really love to have. And I don't know that that's really the healthiest personal decision for me right now. And so, you know, I went on to pursue other things, this included, and I've enjoyed that process. But the more and more I think about it now and I look back and remember that amazing experience, I think, you know, maybe it ought to be the next goal.